This program is brought to you by Stanford University. Please visit us at stanford.edu. Um, Graham's uh, father was a minister and had been a friend of Du Bois. And this probably led her to think that she could write to him. Um, but also she was a member, one of those members of the black talented 10th that Du Bois had always believed would save the race. Uh, Graham had grown up in a household where she was exposed to uh, uh, political and social issues. She had watched her father stand in the pulpit of his uh, AME, that's African Methodist Episcopal Church in New Orleans, with a loaded gun um, prepared to defend his congregation from a mob threatening to drive him out of town because of his activist preaching. Um, as a child, she listened intensely as her father read to her from various books, um, Uncle Tom's Cabin, Victor Hugo's uh, Les Miserables, um, but mostly the Bible. And, and he always took the social gospel message from the Bible. And I mentioned this, this social gospel being so important uh, in African American history, that notion that the Bible is basically a, a text um, urging Christians to sacrifice for social justice. She gained much of her early understanding of the world from the family of issue of the crisis. And when it would come in, her father would read it, or sometimes read it to her when she was younger. Later on, she would read it for herself. That's how she found out what was going on in, in African American um, life throughout the nation. And actually, in the Pan-African world beyond the United States. Her mother encouraged an early interest in music, arranging for piano lessons as the family moved around to various places, finally settling in Spokane, Washington. Uh, she graduated from high school um, in Spokane, but she realized that a talented even a very talented black woman had few opportunities in the America of the 1920s <coughs> and went off to trade school to learn secretarial skills. Uh, she married and quickly gave birth to two sons. But at this point during the 1920s, um, as the Harlem Renaissance was going on, she realized that a settled down married life was not for her. She wanted to be an artist, she wanted to be an intellectual, she wanted to go out into the world. And she had this growing ambition uh, to defy the odds and, and to make a career for herself. She, her parents were quite understanding. Uh, they took her two kids and agreed to care for them while she went off to Paris. She decided that uh, this was the place during the 1920s where a black person could have the freedom to explore their options. She studied at the Sorbonne, um, immersed herself in the small but flourishing community of African Americans and African exiles, um, most of whom arrived in the years after World War I. Um, by the way, if you go to Paris today, you'll find lots of evidence of that flourishing community still, still present. When she returned to the United States, um, her ambitions were almost boundless. Uh, she was determined to write an ambitious epic opera that would use African, uh, the African music that she had learned more about while in Paris, and African American music and dance to illuminate the history of black Americans. Now, obviously, a black woman who takes it into her head that she's going to write operas is going to have a hard time supporting herself. But she was able to uh, teach music, finally get a, a job as a music librarian at, at uh, Howard University, and then as a music and drama teacher at Morgan State while she worked on her opera. And she was able to convince um, a group in Cleveland to actually produce the opera in the midst of the Depression. This is 1932, which did have the advantage that <coughs> there were lots of people looking for even a small wage to appear 
in her opera. So she had a cast of 500. Um, it was the first opera or musical written by an African-American woman. And it was a great success. It actually, um, you can go back and look at newspaper accounts. The reviews were quite positive. No one had ever seen anything quite like this. This was at a time when uh, there was an African-American presence on Broadway, but it was mostly musical comedy, uh, kind of um, <coughs> not to be taken very seriously. And here this uh, woman was trying to, to tell, present a positive picture of African-American culture going back to the African past. Now, she had already achieved this success, but she felt that she needed something else. She needed some formal training in music, so that's what led her to, to Oberlin. And she also decided that she needed some help in terms of her career, and that's why she reached out to Dr. Du Bois. And uh, this letter, which Abuele will read, um, this again is 1932, uh, Shirley Graham, to Dr. Du Bois. Dear Mr. Du Bois, I have so often consulted your books for information along the lines which most interest me, and now I naturally write to you for advice. In June 1935, <coughs> I hope to take my master's degree from Oberlin College of Music History and Fine Arts. It is my belief that music history in its proper historical as well as artistic setting should hold an important place in our Negro colleges. For so long have our schools been trying to send our students who could sing and play that few of our administrators are going to see the importance of this approach to music. I'm faced with the problem of finding the place where I can put these theories into practice. And so, I'm writing to ask you if you could suggest a college where such a department might be seriously considered. It is true I'm deeply interested in dramatic musical composition. I hope yet to write an opera which will reveal the souls of black folks and music. I've been willing, however, to go back and prepare. <coughs> in the meantime, I'm writing a thesis on the survival of Africanism in modern music. I should deeply appreciate it if you would suggest any material relating to this subject. I read French with ease and German with a dictionary. I trust that this letter does not sound presumptuous. It isn't meant to be. I believe that you'll forgive an enthusiasm for a work which I believe is needed and will bear much fruit. Sincerely, Shirley Graham. Well, Shirley Graham's career during the 1930s, I think you can see in her trajectory and Du Bois's two um, conflicting paths. Like uh, Du Bois, for example, was a person who had seen his height, his influence at its height uh, during the period before 1930. I'd mentioned before how the Depression caused the d subscriptions to um, the crisis to decrease, but more, a new generation of young artists and intellectuals was com coming to the fore during the 1930s. Um, and these were people who were his talented tenth, but they revered Du Bois, but they weren't listening to him as much as they once were. Um, Howard University, for example, had become a center uh, for the talented tenth, kind of a policy center. Uh, Mordecai Johnson had taken over as the first black president of Howard and he began to bring in talented uh, faculty members. Many of these people had scholarly credentials that would have gotten them teaching positions at Stanford and other leading places if not for the race barrier of that time. So for that generation of black intellectuals, Howard was the pinnacle. It, it, was, it was as if you had gotten to Harvard or Stanford at a Actually, Stanford wasn't in that class during those times, uh, but certainly getting to Harvard would have been the equivalent for a white intellectual. Uh, these were people like Charles Houston, who took over uh, the law school and became its dean, trying to build its reputation, bringing in people, uh, young students like 
Thurgood Marshall, uh, demanding excellence, demanding that they uh, devote their careers to not simply their own advancement, but the advancement of the race. Elaine Locke, um, the distinguished writer of the Harlem Renaissance, Renaissance was already on the Howard faculty. Um, Rayford Logan in history, Sterling Brown in literature, Charles Drew in medicine, uh, Ralph Bunch, political science, E. Franklin Frazier in sociology. Any of you who uh, are in any of these disciplines and know anything about the history of your discipline would recognize these names. These are pioneering figures. Um, and they were all, at, at one time or another, at Howard. And they were activists. They were, they were people who felt that they needed to use their knowledge to benefit the race. They had, uh, many of them had radical views. Many of them were activists. They, they formed, they worked with the Scottsboro Defense Committee. Uh, William Hasty, who was a, a professor in the law school, founded the New Negro Alliance to launch boycotts against businesses that discriminated against black workers. They were very interested in international events. Uh, they had an international perspective. Many of them had traveled um, outside the United States, and they had met with the um, exiled leaders of the anti-colonial movement in Africa who were living in Paris and London and other places. Ralph Bunch, for example, met with uh, Jomo Kenyatta, uh, who would later become the, the uh, <coughs> president of independent Kenya. And he wrote an influential book called The Worldview of Race. And he predicted that racial conflict would soon give way to a gigantic class war, uh, which will be waged in the big tent that we call the world. Now, a lot of these people ended up and this is not surprising, they're in Howard University, they're in Washington, advising government agencies or themselves being coming part of the New Deal. So Du Bois, he is kind of sent off to Atlanta, which um, at that time is certainly not the intellectual center um, uh, that Washington was or New York was. And he stays there for the late 1930s and early 1940s. Meanwhile, these, these younger individuals begin to have exert influence and become the spokespersons for the race um, on issues of, of interest to the government, particularly. Now, Shirley Graham went in different kinds of circles. Hers were more artists, um, intellectuals. But that, too, was affected by Roosevelt's New Deal, because many of these individuals, including Shirley Graham, worked for government agencies. That's how they got work. That's, uh, she worked for the Federal Theater Projects. That allowed her, for the first time, to direct plays. Um, she uh, directed a, a play, for example, um, The Swing Mikado, um, which was a black version of the Mikado. And uh, gained a great deal of, of interest because it uh, you know, brought jazz together with um, more classical musical theater. Uh, another among the people that were part of that circle who were influenced or part of government programs, Ralph Ellison, um, later wrote Invisible Man. Zero Neil Hurston uh, worked for a government agency doing work for the Writers Project in Florida, going around uh, taking ethnographic uh, surveys, uh, studying the language and culture of rural blacks in the South. And that, of course, became the source material for her book, Their <coughs> Eyes Were Watching God. Um, Aaron Douglas, Jacob Lawrence, all of these people, she um, knew and was good friends with um, Catherine Durham, Dunham, uh, the choreographer, pioneering choreographer, uh, the first person to really bring black African-American dance uh, to the attention of, of the nation. Uh, she was friends with Ethel Waters, the, the uh, actress and singer. Uh, she was friends with Richard Wright, 
who was, while he was writing um, Black Boy, Langston Hughes. All of these people were in some ways surpassing Du Bois in their influence because they were producing work that was getting a great deal of attention during the 19, 1930s, or they were involved in films or other um, um, parts of the arts. So for Graham, the 30s was a period where she thrived, and she began to uh, develop a name for herself as, as one of the leading figures in the effort to develop black drama. And then, of course, by the end of the 1930s, all of this began to change with the war, um, the end of Roosevelt's New Deal, all of these um, projects, uh, the Federal Theater Project and, and such, um, typically came to an end because at the end of the 30s, they began to be attacked as communist dominated. Uh, for example, the, the Federal Theater Project was basically gutted by Congress because they felt that many of the plays had a left-wing orientation. Many of the people involved in it were left-wingers. And this was certainly true of Shirley Graham and many of the people who worked with her. They did have a notion that theater should be used as a way of protesting against conditions in society, uh, trying to change the world through the arts. Once the United States becomes involved in, in World War II, though, Shirley Graham's career takes another tack. Um, from the beginning of the war, she is moving toward the left, and this is, <coughs> complicates her attitude toward the war because at first, uh, during the late 30s, there was a, a desire to bring the United States into the war on the side of the Allies um, after the war starts in 1939, in part because they saw the um, Soviet Union as the eventual target of Nazi Germany. However, when the uh, Soviet Union and Germany sign a uh, peace treaty, basically non-aggression pact, then that changes the situation in the United States and many of the people on the left wing now decide that the war is um, you know, really a war to destroy, uh, not, not a war to destroy the Soviet Union, but really a war among the imperialist powers. All of this gets resolved, of course, when the Japanese attack Pearl Harbor and the United States is involved in the war, and also when the so uh, Germany attacks the Soviet Union and breaks the pact and the United States enters the war on the side of the Soviet Union. And that opens up lots of possibilities for people such as Shirley Graham. They were able to support the war effort wholeheartedly, and for her that meant going to um, work for the USO. How many of you know what the USO? Um, you know, it it's kind of provides recreational um, outlets for soldiers, and uh, during the war she was assigned to go to Fort Washuka in Arizona. Now a little bit about the background of, of what happened at Fort Washuka. Why were black soldiers, how many of you know where that, anyone know where that fort was? It's in Arizona, southern Arizona, um, out in the desert. It was the largest concentration of black soldiers during World War II. And basically, for many black soldiers, they spent the war sitting in the desert um, because there was this ambivalence about using black soldiers in the war effort, especially in combat roles. Um, during this period, the militancy of black soldiers as well as black civilians increases dramatically, though, because the war becomes a tool for which, by which black Americans try to improve their position in the United States. Um, in the textbook, you'll read about the Double V campaign. What was the Double V? Vict 
victory against fascism and racism. So you have this notion that the war can be used as a tool to end racism at home, fascism abroad. And for internationalists like <laughs> Shirley Graham, the war is also going to end colonialism because how can the allies say that they are fighting for democracy, self-determination, and the leading <laughs> allied powers are imperialists? England, France have colonies. And indeed, during the war, they begin to rely on African Americans in the United States and colonial soldiers abroad, and in uh, France in particular, to fight the war. Indian soldiers become part of the English army. You know, so you can imagine the position of soldiers both in the United States and uh, fighting on behalf of these imperialist powers. They're basically saying, well, you know, look, we might fight the war. First of all, <laughs> if we get drafted, we have to. But we also want to use the war as a way of advancing our, our station once the war ends. And they began to demand the end of colonialism and, in the United States, the end of racism. So you can see what's happening during the war is this building up of expectations about what the war will accomplish. And this is fed by documents such as the Atlantic Charter, which Churchill and Roosevelt get together and decide what are going to be the war aims of the Allies. And they talk about things such as democracy, self-determination. And so they put this forward as a justification for the war and why the Allies are really superior to um, the Axis powers. By the way, Du Bois, as I mentioned uh, earlier, uh, had taken a stand against, uh, in favor of black participation in World War I, arguing that we need to close ranks but come home marching, come home marching for freedom at home. In World War II, uh, Du Bois says that um, he takes a, a much more critical stand of the war, but by that time his voice is overshadowed by that of A. Philip Randolph, because A. Philip Randolph's March on Washington movement puts into action this notion of using the war as a means to advance the position of the race. Uh, the March on Washington movement of 1941, threatening to, to uh, bring 100,000 African Americans to the nation's capital to demand what? To demand equality of treatment in the armed services, to demand jobs in the war industries. Randolph says, uh, Negroes made the blunder of closing ranks and forgetting their grievances in the last war. So he's referring directly to Du Bois. We have resolved that we will not make that blunder again. OK, so Graham comes in as the USO director, and she's sent to Fort Washuka to keep the morale of these black soldiers up. And from the beginning, she uses that position not only to succeed in, in um, you know, doing things that are going to improve morale to the extent possible, but she realized that she's been given an impossible task. The black troops are very discontented there. Number one, they're being trained for only menial roles in the, in the service, um, whatever their qualifications. They're under the um, control of white officers, many of them from the South because according to the, the military, there was a feeling that whites in the South understood blacks better than uh, whites from other parts of the country. And also, there was just more officers who were Southern in the military because of that military tradition. Also, as soon as they left base, they found that they encountered intense discrimination. Um, 
And when they encountered this, rather than being supported by the military, they were basically told to obey the local mores, which meant if um, they were not allowed into a restaurant, don't go into the restaurant. Uh, this is what led Jackie Robinson, for example, in, in Texas in a similar situation to, to face court-martial when uh, he refused to accept Jim Crow on a, on a bus. Um, so all of this was part of what Shirley Graham was up against. But she was enormously successful and, in fact, gained the support of the camp um, general, the, you know, the main officers at Camp Washuka. But she got herself in trouble by getting involved in, in off-camp, off-base um, politics. Uh, she uh, was very vocal in her complaints against the treatment of black soldiers and ultimately was told by the USO that uh, we don't get involved in, in those affairs. And uh, she, they sent her to New York, uh, presumably for a meeting, but as soon as they got there, they said, well, you know, you're not going back, at least not for the USO. Um, and at that point, she again reached out to her friend, um, Dr. Du Bois, asking about new job possibilities. And uh, in this letter, which she writes in 1942, she goes into what was the situation in Fort Washuka. Do you want to? My dear Dr. Du Bois, someday I'm going to write a play about myself, and it will be the season's comedy hit. I did laugh when I read your note this morning. For one brief moment, I saw myself through your voice, through your very wise eyes. And the picture was very funny. One impression, however, I must hasten to correct. I did not leave Fort Wahachaka on my own free will. When I finally did, I have to say, there was such a furor that arose, it shook the Empire State Building here in New York. The commanding colonel of Fort Wachuca, the commanding general of the 93rd Division, wire wrote and radiographed everybody they could think of, all of which greatly angered my ladies at the YWCA USO. They ordered me to come into New York for a conference. When I got here, they coolly informed me that the USO was not interested in some of my activities, which were outside the recreational program of the USO. They could not consider race problems, etc. It seems that the Field Service Administration man out there had written in that I was using my position as a USO director to influence military and civic affairs throughout the state, which was perfectly true. Not so much as to the USO position, but as to the influence. I had things so tied up inside that fort that every time that particular dirty little rat came along with his discriminatory program, I was having him thrown off the reservation. Also, following a riot in Tucson, when a soldier had been given a life sentence, I myself reached the general and influenced him to reopen the case, and by military ruling had the soldier's sentence changed to 10 years. I have been called in to sit on a court-martial case within the fort. These are a few of my unprecedented activities. No, I didn't want to leave Fort Huachuca. I knew I was getting worthwhile things done out there, and I have cried briny tears into my pillow many nights since I've been here in New York. But one most sometimes accept the defeat, or does one. I don't as long as I can wiggle a toe. The story is not finished. The commanding colonel is not threatening to close the USO out there. He says he wants no part of them. I asked him not to do so. Even a little USO is better for the soldiers than none at all. The peculiar thing about the entire situation is that I have been wholly backed by these two military authorities, and only the crummy, hypocritical, religiously controlled USO got cold feet. Can you beat that? Meanwhile. I'm getting off some steam, though, writing an article for the left-wing magazine Common Sense. Collaboration with Seldom Rotman on his book, The Revolutionist, is definitely underway. You can read the excellent review copied from the New York Times in the copy of Common Sense, which I sent you. The work as it stands is not stageable, so say all the Broadway producers. I'm doing a piece of craftsmanship and rewriting on it to make it so. We think we'll have a hit. 
The rather grubby thought of making a living must occupy some of my attention. Were it not for the boys and their schooling, I could practically forget that. I realize I've been a frightful correspondent lately. I did think I'd probably see you this summer, and I could tell you everything. Life with me seems a series of ups and downs, but your little note this morning makes me realize that with it all, I do have a roaring good time. Lovingly, Shirley. As mentioned um, in, in the letter to Du Bois, Shirley Graham was writing um, a great deal during the early 1940s and, and particularly during the World War II period. And um, you can see from her pieces the, the way in which her, her thought was moving more and more to the left, more and more um, critical of the policies of the government. For example, in that Common Sense um, article that she published in 1943, she said, the whole, the whole world in the, uh, uh, the freedom of the colored people is becoming more and more acute um, as the problem of the world. And this is nowhere, this is significant that nowhere are the colored races fighting to maintain and to advance white supremacy. The determination of India has strengthened all dark peoples. Regardless of what may be the objectives or aims of other groups, colored people are fighting for freedom. And then she asked, is it the intention so as to circle and encompass the Negro by segregation and discrimination that we finally will have to have a separate and distinct nation within a nation? Even if this were desirable, uh, possible, is it desirable? in a democracy. And then she goes on and says, the first soldier killed in the American Revolutionary War on Boston Common was Crispus Attucks, a Negro. In World War II, the first American soldier killed at Pearl Harbor was Robert Brooks, a Negro. Now the American Negro is beginning to ask questions. What does it take to make me a citizen of the land in which I was born? I have been loyal. My father was loyal before me. We have fought in every war. We have worked, performed the most menial, and hardest of tasks. My children are educated. I have paid taxes. Now I am called to die for freedom. What of my children's future? Two thirds of all the world, people in the world, are waiting for the answers. A few months after that article appeared, Harlem exploded in, in racial violence. One of the, uh, a number of incidents of racial violence during the war uh, fed by black-white conflicts over jobs, housing. Um, in New York case, the rumor that a white policeman had killed a black soldier. Uh, Shirley Graham wrote, it was the most fantastic, unbelievable night anyone could imagine. And this was a letter to Mary White Ovington, one of the founders of the NAACP and a person who became one of her friends. The five million dollars worth of damage done is no exaggeration. Streets look as if they had been bombed. Later, in a police car, she reported, um, equipped with a loudspeaker, NAACP leaders Walter White and Roy Wilkins uh, drove through the streets saying, the soldier is not dead. Justice will be done. Go home. Stop. But they stopped only after they were exhausted. Terrible, yes. As to the harm done, I'm not so sure, she said. The Negroes in New York in, in five hours destroyed $5 million worth of white property. And you should hear the phone calls we're getting and the committees being formed. Everybody's trying to do something. At the time when she wrote about the, the riot, and um, by the way, the, in the textbook you see that there was a much more serious uh, sustained riot in Detroit fueled by the conflict over jobs in the auto industry and uh, the number of people coming into Detroit uh, trying to get jobs and trying to get housing um, led to an, an, a race riot that went on for several days. Uh, troops that were needed uh, for other reasons were sent into Detroit, um, kind of the similar situation to 1967 when uh, in the midst of the Vietnam War, uh, 
Uh, thousands of troops had to be sent into Detroit at that time. Uh, so this conflict fed the radicalization of, of Shirley Graham. And she decided to take a job with the NAACP, organizing chapters across the nation. And in this brought her together with another woman who I'll lecture on later in this course, Ella Baker, who also had the same job, all, both of them going around the country trying to organize uh, chapters for the organization. And it's significant in both of these cases, you have black women doing the work of actually organizing um, these NAACP chapters, while almost all of the leaders of the NAACP were, um, were men. And the conflicts that develop between the kind of grassroots perspective of someone like Shirley Graham or Ella Baker, I think contributed to the later conflicts that we'll talk about when we get to the 50s and 60s, with the NAACP distrusting grassroots activism, even though they need to have the support of masses of blacks at the local level to send in their dues. But they wanted them to basically be passive members of the organization and allow the organization to be uh, directed from New York. Um, for Graham, this doesn't last very long. She, does, she stays there for about a year. But she does succeed enormously in building new chapters. The NAACP membership goes from about 40,000 to about 10 times that number by the end of the war. This is the largest that the NAACP ever gets, uh, including today, uh, in terms of its membership. And this is largely because of this growing sense, this growing agreement among African Americans that they need to take um, to <coughs> use the war to advance the race. At the same time she's working for the NAACP, though, Shirley Graham does something in secret, which uh, uh, she joins the Communist Party. And it's never quite clear when this happens. But certainly by the end of the war, she's a member of the party and part of a small but vibrant community of, of communists in Harlem. Now, as I mentioned in the previous lecture, the Communist Party was a very dynamic force during the 1930s. By World War II, it was less uh, significant as a, as a political force, but it still had a great deal of influence within the black community, primarily because many of the artists and intellectuals have, were either part of the party or close to the party uh, during the late 30s and early 1940s. And when the war began, it was possible to have a career and still be a communist because after all, the United States was fighting on the same side as the Soviet Union. They were our ally. So someone like Shirley Graham could um, be a communist, at least close to the communist, but it's significant that even then, she, she did not publicize the fact of her Communist Party membership. It's possible, actually, that Walter White and other NAACP leaders knew that she was a communist. I mean, one of the things that was also true during the 30s and 40s is that many people who were non-communists used communists because they were great organizers. That was one of the things they were very good at. So the CIO, the unions, the auto workers, the steel workers, many of the people at the grassroots level at trying to organize unions in the factories were communist. And it was tacitly acknowledged even when the leaders of the unions were not communists, um, because they did their work well. Similarly, for the NAACP, as long as Shirley Graham was out bringing members into the organization, they were willing to tolerate the, her leftist ties. How, however, um, her biographer has pointed out that uh, those ties were not unnoticed by the Senate Internal Security Subcommittee even then, uh, which listed her as 
quote, one of the foremost propagandists of the communist cause in the United States and a leader of communist agitprop work among Negro Americans, Americans. What she means by, what they mean by agitprop, um, theater designed to, to deliver a political message. After leaving the NAACP, Graham found work as executive secretary of the Brooklyn Interracial Assembly. Uh, this was uh, one of the protest groups formed during the war, uh, campaigning against uh, police brutality uh, for housing opportunities, health care, jobs. She also began a career, surprisingly, um, especially for that time, successful career as a, a writer of popular biographies. Uh, she decided that she was going to write a biography of George Washington Carver, the scientist, black scientist, as a way of conveying mainly to teenagers, especially black teenagers, something about black history. <coughs> and once she wrote this book, and uh, she found that she could write very fast, um, kind of amazingly so for those of us who struggle for years on the same book, uh, <laughs> Uh, that she could put out these books very rapidly, and they sold, sold well. Uh, she went on to write one um, about singer-actor Paul Robeson, abolitionist Frederick Douglass, and finally she turned to her old friend uh, Dr. Du Bois and wrote a, a book about him. And these books gave her enough income for the first time in her life she, was, she gained the economic security that she had never had. She was then able to actually provide some support for her two sons. But this was too late for her to reestablish connections with one of her sons, Robert, who died of tuberculosis in 1944. She was devastated by this and obviously felt enormously guilty um, about abandoning her son, um, letting uh, her uh, parents um, uh, raise him. And when he dies, this leads her to even more immersing herself in a political life. One of her communist friends advises her there are other Roberts in the world, he said, and therein lies your work, to make your contribution in making that better world so that other mothers will not have to go through the sorrow you are going through today. And um, so after the death of, of Robert, she becomes immersed in both her writing and her political work. And at that point, she begins to reestablish her connection with um, Dr. Du Bois. It happens that um, Du Bois returns to New York. Um, he's driven out of Atlanta University. His views, they, they want to retire him uh, as uh, the NAACP <laughs> wanted to retire him in the 1930s. And he decides to return to New York, and he's invited to do research for the NAACP. Now you can imagine Du Bois during this period of his life um, feeling like he's coming back to the organization that he founded, but rather than coming back in a policy-making position, he's being brought back basically to advise Walter White of how to take the NAACP into the post-war period. Uh, Walter White basically recognizes that um, du Bois has connections, has a mind, who, um, unparalleled mind, unparalleled understanding of the implications of the war for black Americans. He wants that advice, but he doesn't really want to give up any of his um, power and influence to Du Bois. But Du Bois returns uh, to New York, and so he and Shirley Graham are, for the first time, in close proximity to each other, and it's during this time that their relationship becomes um, ever closer. Now, I, I mentioned in the last lecture that uh, Du Bois um, was in, 
involved in an unsatisfying marriage. Um, his wife was not a partner in what he was doing outside of the home. And as I, as I mentioned um, before, that he found his, his own life much uh, more outside the home than inside the home. And leaving his wife there, he felt guilty about it. But nonetheless, he left her there. And um, when he wrote that candid assessment that I quoted from in the last lecture, he probably had Shirley Graham in mind when he complained that, quote, the ties between human beings are usually assumed to be sexual if a man and a woman are concerned. Um, now, he was saying that in order to deny that that was his object. But in any case, their correspondence does suggest that their relationship was becoming ever closer. Um, the early letters, as you've heard, uh, he writes to Miss Graham. By the mid-1940s, it's my dear Shirley. And in one of these letters, he suggests that they arrange to spend weekends together. In one note, uh, Du Bois asks Graham to spend the night with him during a weekend stay in Manhattan. Yet, although the relationship had become romantic, it is not evident that their relationship was sexual. Given his frankness about other matters, I'm inclined to believe him when he said, when he wrote that, quote, sex indulgence was never the cause or aim of his friendship with women, especially, and he included in that group, dreamers toward a better world, which I think is a reference to Shirley Graham. Now, whether or not the relationship was sexual, and there's, um, biographers could differ over that, it, it was definitely intensely political. Shirley Graham drew Du Bois into her left-wing world, introducing him to artists and intellectuals who were party members or what was then called fellow travelers. And these people included um, individuals such as Paul and Essie Robeson, who I will discuss in Thursday's lecture. Uh, Max Jurgen, uh, the founder of the Council on African Affairs, along with Paul Robeson. I mentioned the Council on African Affairs, founded in the late 1930s, to focus African-American attention on the uh, anti-colonial struggle that's going on in Africa. Max Jurgen, by the way, would uh, turn against um, the communists. Uh, he one day walked into the FBI and basically uh, chain sides in the Cold War. Uh, one of her friends was the white historical novelist Howard Fast, um, who had encouraged her to begin writing historical um, books on her own. New York City Councilman Benjamin Davis, uh, probably, I, I think at that time, the only elected communist um, in the United States. Marvel Cook, Marvel Jackson Cook, who had once assisted him on the crisis and later became a writer for the communist newspaper People's Voice. And Herbert Aptheker, um, a white communist historian, a graduate of Columbia University, who was to make a name for himself, um, well, who became Du Bois's research assistant at uh, the NAACP and later made a name for himself as one of the leading historians of African-American life. Uh, some of you may know that uh, Herbert Aptheker was um, a pioneer in writing about the freedom struggles of African-Americans. Uh, he wrote a, his honors thesis on American Negro, his um, dissertation on the American Negro slave revolts at a time when most historians emphasize the docility of, slavery, of, of slaves. Um, du Bois of Aptecker also wrote a, a um, monumental um, documentary um, uh, edition called um, Documentary History of the Negro People in the United States, a seven-volume um, 
documentary history, which for my generation of historians was one of the basic books we had available in the early um, 1970s when I began graduate studies. If you wanted to get something more than the mainstream interpretation of African American life, one of the places you went to was Herbert Aptheker. Um, as a um, Jewish communist, he brought a perspective to the study of African American life which many of us found quite appealing. It happens uh, that uh, for many of us who work at the King Institute, he also became a, 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 um, a person who spent a lot of time over at the Institute on this campus um, late in his life. Uh, he became our kind of volunteer editor, um, helping us with editing the, the papers of, of Martin Luther King, and uh, just would come in at least once a week and spend a few hours uh, uh, working with us and giving us the benefit of his long experience doing a documentary editing. Uh, when he passed on, we decided, uh, if you go over there today, you'll find that the library is called the Herbert Aptheker Library because of his uh, contribution. Well, Shirley Graham succeeded in getting Du Bois into these kinds of circles. Du Bois probably would have found those circles anyway because during the war, he came to the conclusion that the war needed to be, uh, but during the war that um, he wanted to bring the United States to a new policy with respect to uh, colonialism and racism. And he felt that this could be done if the United States did not have such a close relationship with the imperialist powers, or at least put pressure on them to uh, end their colonial policies. After the war, he sees that the drive to create a United Nations is going to be a crucial policy decision for the United States, because what is the United Nations policy going to be toward racism and colonialism? For him, it was kind of a replay of World War I. After World War I, the League of Nations is established. Do they take a, a policy against colonialism? No, they don't. Uh, because the, the key uh, nations in forming the League of Nations were the imperialist powers. So rather than bringing democracy to South Africa, South Africa becomes um, the, the problems of South Africa become the problems to be dealt with by England and France um, primarily and the United States secondarily. He wants to make sure that after World War II this does not happen with the United Nations. Now Graham also was trying to get Du Bois to come into the Communist Party. I think this is clear from a 1945 letter that we've found that she writes to communist leaders urging the recruitment of Du Bois, arguing that guiding and shaping of this one man will be reflected in the lives and actions of thousands of other people. And this letter has been used as a, as a way of saying that, you know, well, what is her motive in terms of trying to become friends with Du Bois? Is it trying to uh, she's long admired him, and in fact, later on she says that she really was in love with him from um, um, the 1930s on. Um, or is it more nefarious that she is really trying to recruit him into the Communist Party? Well, I think it, it's clear when you look at all the letters in context that she first of all wanted to have a relationship with, with Du Bois. She wanted to become closer to him. The issue of recruiting him into the Communist Party, first of all, she fails. <laughs> he doesn't, he remains skeptical, um, and this skepticism was rooted in his unparalleled understanding of African American history. Because he's basically skeptical of the notion that white and black workers will ever build a revolutionary movement together. 
But at the end of World War II, Du Bois and Shirley Graham both agree that the Cold War is a disaster. That it's at that point that the cost of being affiliated with the Communist Party increases dramatically. Within a year of the end of the World War II, the, the Cold War and anti-communist policies are stepped up in the United States. The Soviet Union is no longer an ally but an enemy. Pro-Soviet sentiments are now considered subversive and even traitorous. It was a political disaster because it divided the civil rights movement. It divided the forces in favor of, of ending colonialism. Now there were communists in support of civil rights, and there are anti-communists in, in support of civil rights, and they're going at each other at the same time they're trying to end racism. So although Du Bois remains outside the Communist Party, he ultimately suffers more than Graham from the anti-communist persecutions of the Cold War era. He's more of a target because he's more, better known. Now what happens in the Cold War? I'll just give you, I certainly think by this time, I'm hoping that you will have read the textbook and kind of get some sense of what the Cold War is all about. The importance of the meetings leading up to the founding of the, in, of the United Nations that take place right here in the Bay Area. Um, how many of you just you know who represented the NAACP at these meetings? At, that led to the United Nations. Anyone done enough reading so far? They may be imperialist powers, but these are our allies, and we can't press them too hard. We want them to eventually end colonialism, but it has to be in a gradual way. And we definitely don't want the United Nations taking a position against any kind of colonialism. Why? Well, the United States has its own colonies. I mean, at this point, the Philippines are still a colony of the United States, even though um, after the war uh, they gained their independence. Well, the, the representatives are Bethune, Mary McLeod Bethune, rep comes Walter White, and Du Bois. Um, and clearly, Walter White saw himself as the spokesperson for the NAACP. But Du Bois wrote the position paper. He writes um, an, an appeal, and it basically argues that the United Nations should take an explicit stand against racism and colonialism. What happens at the meetings, though, is that this appeal gets support from the Soviet Union, but not from the United States. Because the, United, the Soviet Union sees this as a way of basically turning the tables on France and, <coughs> and England and saying, you need to take care of this problem that you've got, and presenting itself as the friend of the anti-colonial forces while at the same time the United States is saying we don't want the United Nations intervening in what are essentially the domestic affairs of these European nations. They're going to take care of their colonial problem, but it'll be at their own pace. And furthermore, the United States won't even join the United Nations if it's opposed by southern politicians. Well, why would Southern politicians be particularly against joining the United Nations? What did they see coming down the road? Well, if the United Nations could intervene on a racial issue, what's to prevent the United Nations from intervening on the issue of segregation and discrimination in the South? So you have this you know, tacit agreement 
among France, England, and southern politicians in the United States, all saying the United Nations should not intervene in the internal affairs of its member nations. A decision that has a lot of implications even for today with respect to the United Nations. Now this, the comprom a compromise is, comes out of this in which Eleanor Roosevelt is named to chair a UN commission to deal with the human rights issue. And this leads to the UN Declaration on Human Rights. Now, the UN Declaration of Human Rights is a very important document in the history of human rights. It, it, it really establishes a framework for human rights around the world, but there was no enforcement. How are you going to enforce human rights? That's the problem we still have today. So, basically what happened is that under Eleanor Roosevelt, you develop a, a framework for human rights defining what it is, but the UN Charter provides no effective mechanism for enforcing it when one of the member nations is the violator of human rights. After the Charter for the UN was drafted in uh, 1945, the black pro-civil rights forces begin to divide, and it divides over the Cold War issue. Du Bois is quite disappointed that, uh, disappointed to say the least, that the UN Charter um, did not include ex uh, any explicit language relating to racism or anti-colonialism. And after that, he also begins to become much more critical of the Truman administration. Truman becomes president after Roosevelt's death. The Truman administration's handling of the issue of UN policies on colonization and racial discrimination. And this is combined with an outbreak of violence against returning black soldiers. And I invite you to read more in the textbook about that. Um, there's uh, a wave of violence across the South, mostly directed against s returning black soldiers. And it's designed to send a very specific message. You may have thought that going into the military was going to improve your situation at home. We're here to remind you that is not the case. And you have um, Truman, um, many blacks demanding that that Truman do something about this situation. Truman is concerned, but he understands that the base of the Democratic Party is in the white segregationist South. So he faces a dilemma. And just to, you know, the, the politics, I, you know, I think unless you read the text, you're not going to really understand all the politics of the late 1940s. But basically what happens is that the 1948 election becomes the crucial turning point. Because what happens there is that Truman runs for president. <coughs> it looks like he's going to lose because he's, he's alienated his Democratic base by having to crush a lot of strikes that happen after the war. And um, it's, it's not clear how he's going to win. But even his mildly pro-civil rights policies alienate the southern wing of the party so much that they create the Dixiecrats and run their own candidate. Who's that candidate? Strom Thurmond. Okay, Strom Thurmond runs as a Dixiecrat. The ironic result of that is that Truman then is able to move further on the civil rights issue because he's no longer worried about alienating the white Dixiecrats, they're going to leave the party and have, the, uh, have their own com campaign. Furthermore, Truman's left wing, 
becomes the Progressive Party under Henry, Henry Wallace. So you have a four-way election. Republicans and Democrats, Dixiecrats, and the Progressive Party. So Truman manages to en engineer a victory by taking pro-civil rights stands, establishing civil rights commission, integrating the armed forces, or at least beginning the process of integrating the armed forces, giving on a lot of these key issues, gaining enough of the black vote to make a difference in the election, at the same time becoming staunchly anti-communist. Because now he doesn't have to worry about alienating his left wing of the party. They've left. They're in the progressives. So he joins the anti-communist crusade, takes a pro-civil rights stand. Who benefits from this? The NAACP, because now they're in alliance with Truman. What they have to do is get rid of their left wing. So all these organizations, including the NAACP, engage in an anti-communist purge of all their members. So by the end of the 1940s, people like Shirley Graham and Du Bois are on the margins of American politics. They had their best shot with the Progressive Party. It didn't, it fizzled in terms of, uh, even in the black community, uh, most black people supported Truman. Why? The Progressive had a better policies on, on civil rights issues, but Truman, if he got elected, was going to be able to deliver. There was never any thought that the Progressive Party would actually win the election. So by the end of the 1930s, black leftists are under assault. And this is true with especially with respect to W.E.B. Du Bois and Paul Robeson, who are the leading leftist, black leftist figures of the late 1940s. I'll talk about Robeson um, on Thursday. But for Du Bois, he is targeted primarily because of his statements against the Cold War. Um, for most of the black leftists, they, their attack is against the Cold War. They're seeing this as, as damaging to the civil rights cause, damaging to the anti-colonial cause. And um, Du Bois uh, makes a number of statements in 1949, 50, attacking the Cold War, attacking the Truman administration. But what gets him prosecuted is when he agrees to head a group called the Peace Information Center. And the Peace Information Center tries to distribute information in the United States about um, uh, calling for world disarmament and um, getting rid of nuclear weapons. He sent a letter by the, um, by the Justice Department saying that he needs to register as an agent of a foreign power. They don't specify what the foreign power is, but it's pretty clear what they're implying is that it's the Soviet Union. He doesn't do this. He, um, he responds by saying that you know, he's not an agent of anyone. He's just for peace. But he's prosecuted for this, put on trial, and in the midst of all of this, his wife dies. So by the time that he is indicted, his wife, Nina, 
had, had passed on in, in 1950. He's indicted early in 1951. And at that point, um, Shirley Graham in 1951, just as he is going about to go to trial, um, he proposes to her. And they are married um, um, almost as he is being um, um, put on trial. And uh, this was the recollection of Howard Fast, one of Graham's friends about the announcement of marriage. She said to me, Howard, I have an interesting announcement for you. What is it? What is that, Shirley? She said, Dr. Du Bois proposed to me and I'm going to marry him. I said, Shirley, my God, you're a woman in your 40s. Actually, she was 50, but you know, um, she often lied about her age. Um, you marry a man in his 80s, you're giving up all hope of sex for the rest of your life. She said, Howard, how little you know about sex. Um, they were married. <laughs> um, they were married in, um, as in secret first because um, they wanted to, uh, to be married before the trial started, and then they announced it to her friends, had a public ceremony. And Du Bois went on trial. He was ultimately acquitted. It was a pretty um, bogus trial, even in the context of the Cold War. Uh, for example, they had, he had already disbanded the Peace Information Center because they felt that um, it was being targeted by the Justice Department. But the Justice Department then said, well, you still have to register it as an agent of the foreign power. If he had registered as an agent of a foreign power, he would have been subject to other laws. If he didn't register, he was breaking the law requiring him to register. So it was kind of a catch-22, and, and, and a Republican judge recognized that and, and basically um, led, directed the trial to lead to his acquittal. But one of the results of the trial is that his passport was taken away. Shirley Graham and Du Bois then began their life in, in, during the Cold War as a married couple. Uh, he not a member of the party, she as a member of the party. And you would think that he in his 80s would have by now decided that he had had a very rich life and it was time to move on to other things, maybe even retire. But um, as I will talk about in future lectures, they both have a great deal of living to do uh, during the 1950s and 1960s, which will a uh, period that will see them becoming involved very much in the anti-colonial movement as a, as a um, supporter of Kwame Nkrumah and ultimately going to, to Ghana uh, to help Kwame Nkrumah and uh, the, build the first independent African nation. Um, sub sub Saharan African nation uh, during the early 1960s. Uh, Shirley Graham herself uh, continues a career that uh, brings her into um, many parts of the nation, uh, many parts of the world, including uh, China, Africa, uh, Europe. Uh, she is a becomes a major figure in her own right in terms of the international. Uh, campaign against colonialism. Uh, by the way, her son, her surviving son, David uh, Du Bois, becomes a leader of the Black Panther Party here in the Bay Area um, uh, later in the 1960s. I wanted to end um, with a just a brief um, uh, selection from Shirley Graham Du Bois. Once she is married to um, W.E.B. Du Bois, and it kind of gives you some idea about what their life was like in the early 1950s. This is excerpted from His Day is Marching On, a memoir of W.E.B. Du Bois. At home, 31 Grace Court, Brooklyn. We had moved into 31 Grace Court that summer, but had no chances yet to make it a home. Getting into the house was not as easy as we had anticipated. Arthur Miller and his family moved out of the upper duplex as soon as the final papers for the sales were signed. But upon inquiring as to, the low, as to how soon the lower apartment would be vacated, 
we learned that the Davenports had no intention of moving. They had been there six or seven years, like the place, had a lease. When we protested that the sale of the building terminated the lease, the lawyer said, that's a rather tricky problem which can be argued. I was appalled. Don't despair, Shirley, Paul advised. Go out yourself and talk with the Davenports. Explain how important it is that you have the lower duplex. Tell them the doctor simply cannot climb up those stairs. I phoned immediately Mrs. Davenport was not in, but I left a request that she phone our apartment. She did so that afternoon. W.E.B. answered and made an appointment for me to call on them the following evening. It was the middle of May, and even before I turned into Grace Court, I caught the fragrance of fruit trees blooming in the gardens. Window boxes at 31 Grace Court had geraniums and clusters of purple flowers. It was all so inviting. I was filled with misgivings, lest I fell on my mission. The Davenports received me graciously. She was a slender, pleasant, white-haired woman. Her husband looked every inch the banker. Hardly was I seated when Mrs. Davenport asked, who was that exceedingly charming man who answered the telephone yesterday, Mr. Boys? My husband, I answered, smiling. I have seldom in my life heard such a beautiful diction. It was a pleasure to hear him speak. Oh, <laughs> that's just his Harvard accent. Harvard, explained Mrs. Davenport. Mr. Davenport, is your husband a Harvard man? Yes, he is. The man was looking at me now intently. And your name is Du Bois? Would you be related to the Du Bois? I mean, the scholar. <laughs> I'd rather think my husband is the Du Bois, was my answer. But surely not, the astonishment was real, that Du Bois was at Harvard during the last century. Why, I had to study his PhD thesis when I was a student there. It's volume one of the Harvard Historical Series. And by George, it was a hard reading. That's W.E.B. Du Bois, all right, I said. <laughs> but now the Davenports were frankly puzzled, and so I explained that I was his second wife, that we had married only the past February, and that we had bought the building with, his particular, with this particular duplex in order that he should have a pleasant, comfortable home with only a short flight of stairs with space for a garden and flowers in a quiet neighborhood. The Miller's apartment is larger and gets more sunshine, said Mrs. Davenport, hopefully. Mr. Davenport spoke impatiently. Her husband couldn't climb those stairs. Then to me, I suppose, Dr. Boyce retired from all activities long ago. Is he in good health? Evidently, these good people had heard nothing of the trial. Oh, yes, indeed. He's still teaching and writing. The banker regarded me with polite interest, but I did not, impress, did I, but I did not press the matter further. He turned to his wife. We'll be going away for the summer soon anyhow. They probably could find something suitable for us by fall. After a pause, he added reasonably, these people have bought the building and need the apartment. I could see the struggle in the woman's face. She did not want to give up her pleasant home, and heaven knows I did not blame her. But the old school Taiwan, give my regards to Dr. Du Bois, said Mr. Davenport as I was leaving. Tell him I'll look up some of his later books. I shan't hold the one they made me read against him. I recommended the souls of black folks on his letter, The World and Africa. See you on Thursday. The preceding program is copyrighted by Stanford University. Please visit us at stanford.edu.